Hola, hola, buenos dias, and welcome to the Andes in central Chile's Mali region. I'm up here at around 2,600 meters in elevation, and I've come to this region in search of a specific cactus, Ostracactus philippii, synonymous with Ostracactus hibernus. And it's a cactus which mostly only occurs in Argentina, however it does make its way just over the Chilean border. And in this particular location, I'm only around two or three kilometers from the border with Argentina. However, I don't expect to find this cactus at such high elevations. However, alpine habitats uh, such as these are home to a whole range of other endemic flora. And in amongst these rocks here, I've noticed a uh, species from the genus Viola. And this is Viola congesta and it makes up a part of the subsection Andinium along with around 34 other species which are only endemic to the Andes here in South America and it's a really ornamental plant and also really well adapted to alpine conditions and so you notice uh, its compact form all of those leaves are really uh, tightly compressed together and it's also retracting right down in against those rocks and also right down to ground level and that's an adaptation to help it cope with the really cold temperatures here so in winter it can get down to as low as negative 10 degrees celsius and by being so close to the ground wind temperatures are just slightly warmer They're also really well camouflaged. There are really quite a lot of plants here. You have to be careful not to stand on them. They actually uh, closely resemble just some of the natural rocks occurring in this habitat and even just the soil. And that's a really great example of defensive masquerades. So it's an adaptation that these uh, plants have evolved as defense against uh, predation from herbivores so if you look at these they really just uh, look exactly the same color as the soil They're just coming towards the end of summer here in Chile and so I'm right at the end of the flowering season with a couple of mature plants are uh, still just in bloom and this one's even producing quite a lot of seeds And even though we're still in summer, you can see uh, snow-capped mountains over there. And all of that's uh, melting and forming some really nice rivers in the area. And down here we've got a nice uh, oxalis blooming. And right next to it, a member of the Euphorbiaceae family. This is a uh, Euphorbia collina. And these plants can actually get quite big. The slightly larger one just here. And they form a really massive cortex and taproot that goes deep underground. And in winter time, when it snows here, all of those vegetative shoots die right back. And then when the snow melts at the beginning of spring, reshoots again. And it actually has really striking resemblance to uh, Euphorbia thinophylla from northern Chile, which occurs in the Coquimbo, Atacama and Antofagasta regions. Um, but up there, it occurs as a coastal plant growing in sand dunes. Let's go and keep searching for Ostracactus. Here we've got a really nice member of the Amaryllidaceae family, Rotophila rotolirion. Beautiful flowers. And I'm not sure if this is actually the usual blooming time for them or whether recent rain events have triggered it. So a couple of weeks ago, um, a few inches of rainfall actually fell on the area, which is quite unusual for this time of year. And here we've got a member of the Apoaceae family. Azarella prolifera. quite common through the Andes 
another member of the Apiaceae family. This is Azarella monantha. Would you believe me if I told you it's a member of the carrot and parsnip family? Certainly doesn't look like it until you see the flowers or the seeds which uh, look like those of parsnip. Yeah, it actually looks a lot like a young uh, Azarella compactor from the Altiplano in the north. Really compact growth habit. I wonder if it also develops a taproot like Azarella compacta. Alpine asters, Chukiraga oppositifolia. Oh, they really light up these mountainsides. And actually, there's one uh, just starting to go to seed here. And you notice that the seeds have actually. Got these nice white hairs or trichomes attached to them. Well suited for wind dispersal. And there's another nice member of the Asteraceae family just down here. Muticia. Muticia linearifolia. That's my first time seeing this one and the flowers are really unique. Seen plenty of uh, Muticia subulata in the area too the nice red flower. I know, I know, I'm supposed to be looking for Ostracactus. It's just so diverse here. Let's go down, let's go down and find Ostracactus. Okay, so I've just been walking along that river down there and I decided to take a walk up this ridge here and have a look in these rocky outcrops and I've come across uh, Eriosize curvy spina possibly form or subspecies Lysocarpa and this is easy to identify as an Eriosize uh, classic fruit morphology there too late for flowers I haven't uh, come across any Alstra cactus yet, but I'm going to try a little bit further up there and even back down along that river. Beautiful place. I managed to find a population of Alstra cactus philippii, synonymous with Alstra cactus hibernus. And it wasn't easy. I've had a pretty thorough look through most of this valley here and the surrounding area and I only managed to find one small subpopulation, although it is healthy. There's a couple of small individuals there. And that's what a mature plant looks like. One of the first things that I noticed is that they have really strong morphological convergence with Echinocereus in the Northern Hemisphere. but only in their body morphology, the flowers between the two genera are quite distinct. And they're actually really cryptic in habitat, really difficult to spot, especially because they're growing amongst so much other vegetation. So for example, this small shrub here has at least five mature plants growing directly underneath it. And this is what a really mature plant looks like. Must have at least 15 different shoots on it. Scattered throughout that scrub. And you know, like you kind of serious, I guess they're not too showy until they start flowering. But, uh, you know what, the more that you get interested in, in the cactus family as a collective, or even plants in general, the more it becomes about their story, their ecology, adaptations, evolution, and less about uh, their ornamental value. And it even becomes about 
understanding and learning about the explorers or the describers the people who discovered these plants so for example the species name Philippi is an ode to the German Chilean paleontologist uh, Rodolfo Philippi and the genus name Ostracactus derives from the Latin word Australis which translates to south or southern and it's littered all throughout botanical nomenclature to describe the southernmost species of a genus or even incorporated into the genus name like Ostracactus uh, in reference to its southern distribution so it only starts to appear around the level of Santiago and goes all the way down into Patagonia and you might even hear people saying Austral summer or Austral winter or even Australia, the country where I'm from, translates to southern land. Now it's time to start making my way back down the valley, check out a couple more interesting plants and then call it a day. So I've dropped down to around 1,000 metres in elevation now and I've climbed up this seasonal waterfall. Been noticing a lot of puya in the area and also some eriocyce growing on these rocky outcrops. And I'm also coming across Gunnera tinctoria, the Chilean rhubarb. And it's actually completely unrelated to rhubarb, but it has similar culinary uses here in Chile. And it also occurs in Argentina too. It's made its way into cultivation as an ornamental plant and this one is really just a baby. When you go down further south, they can reach heights of well over two meters. And the Puya in the area, uh, Puya Corolea, variation Montebana. And they differ from the classic Puya Corolea by having much more elongated leaves. And I'm not here in the blooming season, so I can't comment on any differences in the flowers. The eriosites appear to be curvy spina types, but there is also a possibility they could be uh, subgivosa, subspecies Castanea, which is an inland species. But it might be too far inland. I'm around 150 kilometers from the coast, but I'm going to try and get a bit closer to them and take a better look. Here's a closer look at the Puya. Anyone who's grown these or has visited them in habitat will be aware of their hook spines. And these things really latch on and uh, will just uh, tear you apart. So always have to be cautious when walking around in Puya habitats. But a beautiful bromeliad. Really nice frosted leaves. Highly ornamental plant, really great in landscape gardens. So I've managed to get closer to the eriosice. Classic eriosice style fruit there again. And these are definitely curvy spina. And they'd be subspecies Lysocarpa. This is a really healthy habitat. I'm noticing a lot of plants around on these uh, rocky outcrops here. There's plenty of younger individuals. And also some really big mature plants like these. I'd love to see the flowers. And, uh, the body morphology certainly is a little different to the classic Eriosize Kirby Spina and even different to uh, subspecies Armada which occurs a little bit further to the north of here. Well that's it for me today. Time to make my way down. Thanks for coming on the adventure and I'll see you in the next video.